He was a small man with big brown eyes, not a poor boy. His grandfather left in the state of $9 million all in cash. <laughs> we didn't trust stocks and bonds. But anyway, Cole was in Paris in 1919 after the war, looking quite sharp. And he met Linda Lee Thomas, this uh, divorced woman who said to have been the most beautiful woman in Europe. And when the opportunity arrived to marry uh, Cole Porter, uh, the fact that he was homosexual and that there would be, that it would be what is called a white marriage didn't disturb her at all. Though he was prominent in high society, Cole wanted popular acclaim. And in 1928, he found it with a show called Paris. And the song that did it was Let's Do It. The dragonfly in the reed, do it. Sentimental centipede, do it, lad, do it, lad. Fall in love, mosquitoes, heaven forbid, do it. So does every Katie did, do it, lad. Cole Porter wrote based partly on Browning and partly on uh, Gilbert of Gilbert and Sullivan, uh, the, the most delectable uh, rhymes. Uh, rhyme after rhyme after rhyme, and also lighthearted. You're the cop. You're Mahatma Gandhi. You're the top. You're Napoleon Brandy. You're the purple light of a summer night in Spain. You're the National Gallery. You're Gobble Salary. You're Telephane. You're a knight in the streets of Cairo. You're a flight in an auto gyro. I'm the lazy hound that hangs around the shop. Oh. But a baby on the bottom, you're the top. If I were looking for one show to represent the 1930s, it would be Anything Goes. Book by Lindsay and Krauss, songs by Cole Porter, starring Ethel Merman, William Gaxton, Victor Moore, and an incredible Porter score. You're the top, tells people, in 1934. Yeah, we're all feeling lousy, but now maybe it's time to feel a little better. And we sort of think about the show and that song as the sort of civilized embodiment of the Roosevelt recovery. But if baby, I'm the bottom, you're the top. Night and day, you are the one. Only you beneath the moon and under the sun. Whether near to me or far, it's no matter, darling, where you are, I think of you. Night and day. In 1932, in the Broadway show Gay Divorce, Fred Astaire sang Porter's hit, Night and Day. Two years later, he performed the song again in his first starring film role. This time with Ginger Rogers. In the silence of my lonely room, I think of you. Night and day. Fred Astaire was the ideal conveyor of the Cole Porter attitude toward life. He was so debonair. What a dude he was, and how immaculately uh, his little body put on those clothes. He could utter with perfect conviction what Cole Porter gave him to utter. Glamour was part of the bomb of the Depression. It was part of the dream. When the culture is collapsing around you, glamour is very persuasive. And it's about hope, isn't it? It's about belief. It's about making something irresistible. In the 1930s, when people felt the anguish and pain of the economic privation, it's ironic, isn't it, that Cole Porter, a man who was wealthy and sophisticated, could reach people in a way that other people couldn't. Cigarette? We 
used to go to Harlem, George Gershwin and I, sometimes in what the song says, in ermine and pearls, all dressed up, you know. He was always received like an honored guest. And everybody adored George because of who he was and what he was. Most of the time I knew him, he was working on Porgy and Bess. And this was a very big project and an enormous undertaking. And so he talked a great deal about it. I used to go up to his apartment he would say, come on up, and maybe you could sing a couple of bars of summertime and help me with the orchestration. And I did that until I figured out that this was a ploy. The way other men said, come on up and see my etchings, he said, come on up and help me with my orchestration. <laughs> In his most ambitious work for Broadway, George Gershwin set out to create an opera, but one that would appeal to the many rather than the cultured few. Gershwin called it a folk opera. He was a man of his time, and artists in the 30s were going back to the roots of American culture, the, the land, the, the ordinary people, digging into rural life and the common folk. Gershwin's inspiration for this experiment had come from DuBose Hayward's best-selling novel, Porgy. It followed a painful love story of a crippled black man in a southern tenement. Gershwin and Hayward went down to Folly Island, South Carolina, to soak up the musical ambiance there. As we sat listening to their spirituals, to George, it was more like a homecoming than an exploration. The Gullah prides himself on what he calls shouting. This is a complicated rhythmic pattern beaten out by feet and hands at a Negro meeting on a remote sea island. George started shouting with them, and eventually, to their huge delight stole the show from their champion shouter, DuBose Hayward. I decided against the use of original folk material because I wanted the music to be all of one piece. Therefore, I wrote my own spirituals and folk songs. But they are still folk music. George Gershwin. You is my woman now. laugh and sing and dance for two instead of one. I had an appointment to sing for him. To my surprise, got off the elevator, he opened the door and it was he. In an all white uniform, white clothes. And I said, I'm Todd Duncan. And he said, I'm George Gershwin. It was on that day that after I sang, just a part of an old Italian song, uh, aria, just part of it. He looked up and he said, will you be my porgy? Oh, I got plenty of nothing, and nothing plenty for me. I got my girl, I got my song, I got him the whole long. Oh, there's no use complaining. Under the direction of Reuben Mamoulian, and with Ira Gershwin providing lyrics for songs like It Ain't Necessarily So, the production opened at the Alvin Theatre on October 10, 1935 to an audience that included both drama and music critics. John Mason Brown, New York Evening Post. It is a Russian who has directed it, two Southerners who have written its book, two Jewish boys who have composed its lyrics and music, 
and a stage full of Negroes who sing and act it to perfection. The result is one of the far-famed wonders of the melting pot, the most American opera that has yet been seen or heard. That's a folk opera. That's an absolute opera, as far as I'm concerned. And when it's done on Broadway, it's a Broadway show. Uh, this is my favorite. I mean, you know, that's, that's... I think there's Porgy, and then I think there's everything else. Dubose Hayward's lyrics are the best lyrics ever written, I think, for the musical stage. They're true poetry, but the music doesn't overblow them, and it only enriches them, and they enrich the music, too. My man's gone now. Summertime. Genuinely poetic. Critical reaction was mixed, prompting an ongoing debate over Gershwin's interpretation of African American culture. Well, I'd like to know what is a black man's opera in the first place. I mean, he wrote an opera about black people, but that's Gershwin's idea of black people, and it's perfectly valid. The mark in terms of race of a major piece of art in America is not that it masters race. You know, bad word, um, bad verb. It's not going to do that. It's that in some way it is tangling with it and reflecting and showing, you know, those schisms and those contradictions. And I think by those lights, um, it is certainly a major work of art, and at times, particularly thanks to Gershwin, it's a great piece of art. Though it played for 124 performances in its premiere production, Gershwin's folk opera was a financial failure. It would take many years for the work to achieve landmark status. Porgy and Bess was the last thing Gershwin ever wrote for the Broadway stage. On July 11th, 1937, George Gershwin died of a brain tumor at the age of 38. The writer, John O'Hara, lamented, George Gershwin died today, but I don't have to believe it if I don't want to. job programs created by the government's Works Progress Administration was the Federal Theater. Intended to provide work for those in show business, 
It also supplied much needed entertainment that reached 25 million people, a quarter of the population. In the fall of 1936, in a time of misery and despair, with 18 million unemployed in the country, Orson Welles and I formed WPA Project 891, also known as the classical unit of the Federal Theatre. And our third production was a new musical described by its author and composer, Mark Blitzstein, as a labor opera. While we were rehearsing The Cradle Will Rock, it became evident that this was a very hot property. It was about the rise of the CIO. It was about a steel strike. It was about the conflict between the establishment and the new forces within the labor movement. And very soon, it dawned upon the WPA authorities that with Blitzstein's opera, we had a tiger by the tail. For no good reason, just chipped from the start until the finish comes. They feed him out of garbage cans, they breed him in the slums. Joe Worker will go to shops where stuff is on show. He'll look at the meat, he'll look at the bread, and too little to eat sort of goes to the head. One big question inside me cries. How many fakers, peace undertakers, paid strike breakers, how many toiling, ailing, dying, piled up bodies, rather does it take Three days before our premiere, a dozen uniformed WPA security guards invaded the Maxine Elliott Theater. Well, someone wanted to make sure that that play didn't open. Someone was afraid of it. Someone decided to go to the theater and lock it. And uh, nine times out of 10, that would have worked. But they didn't count on the fact that uh, Orson Welles was the director and John Hausman was the producer. And those are two incredibly strong, powerful personalities. They not only believed in their artistic and creative rights, but also in America and what it is to be free in America and what freedom of expression really means. The opening night crowd was led 20 blocks uptown to a new theater. But the cast and musicians were strictly prohibited from performing by both the government and their respective unions. Orson Welles brought composer Mark Blitzstein on stage to play the score. Mark Blitzstein. And he told the actors that there was nothing to stop them from speaking their lines from the audience as citizens exercising free speech. And in the next two hours, all the actors in the cast, with one or two exceptions, stood in the house, stood in boxes, stood in the aisles, ran around, changed their positions, uh, sang songs, duets, separated by the whole width of the theater, did all kinds of extraordinary pieces of improvisation. And the net result of this was one of the most thrilling and extraordinary uh, world premieres uh, I've ever been at or anyone has e ever been at. And that is how The Cradle of the Rock was born. <laughs> In standing up, those actors were risking everything. And when we say everything, you got to remember, this was a time before Social Security, before unemployment insurance, before welfare. If you lost your job, that was it. These people, in doing what they did, were really creating a huge image of courage.
think of the Rogers and Hart shows of the 20s and 30s, ridiculous little stories, but the songs, their songs were thrilling. Articulate, witty, personal, intimate, heart-wrenching. Those depressing and depression years, and they were supplying the art, the, the lyrics and, and the music for a desperate population. It seems we stood and talked like this before. We looked at each other in the same way then, but I can't remember where or when. The clothes you're wearing are the clothes you wore. The smile you are smiling, you were smiling then. But I can't remember. Larry Hart in his lyrics was trying to get more deeply into the human experience. And Rogers was there to accommodate him with the melodies that italicized the words. That's what we'll remember Rogers and Hart for. And so it seems that we have met before and laughed before and loved before. 